Good morning. We're going to read the second part of the giggler treatment today because Miss Melissa um, is not feeling well. So we're going to pick up right where we left off last time. Chapter seven, which should probably be called chapter five, I think, but let's just call it, I don't know what chapter it's supposed to be. The gigglers waited. The shoe was now exactly, exactly, exactly 12 inches and a little bit from the you-know-who. Any second, that whispered the biggest giggler. They waited for the thump, thump, thump. Mr. Mac hopping on one foot and trying not to fall over. They waited for the little thump, Mr. Mac, leaning against the wall. Only three inches of brick and cement away from the giggler's noses. The biggest, biggest giggler looked over the wall and ducked back down again. Ten inches, she said. Cod, said the seagull. Yuck. The middle-sized giggler crammed her other hand and one of her feet into her mouth to stop the giggles from escaping. She fell off the bike, but she made no noise because she landed on soft, long grass. Get off, said the grass. No, I didn't. I'm only laughing. But the time has come to explain why the gigglers were doing this to Mr. Mac. Chapter 8, which should be probably be called Chapter, hang on, 1, 2, 3, 4, oh, stop messing and get on with the story. The day before, Mr. Mac's foot headed straight for the poo, just before it got too dark to play outside, the Mac brothers, Jimmy and Robbie, broke the kitchen window. They were playing football with a burst ball when it happened. Robbie Mack gave the ball a whack with his big toe. It bounced off Jimmy Mack's head, flew at the window, and cracked the glass. Ouch, said Robbie, me toe. Ouch, said Jimmy, me head. Wah, said Mr. Mack, me window. He was upstairs. When he heard the noise, he was in the bathroom, putting a plaster on his finger. He'd cut his finger, putting new glass into the kitchen window just five minutes before the ball cracked it. He ran downstairs into the kitchen and saw the broken window. So he kept running out into the garden. Who did that? He shouted. Not us, said Jobby, Robbie. The ball did it. I only just fixed it, said Mr. Mac. It's not fair. Mr. Mac had had a very hard day. That's seven times I've had to fix that window in seven days, he looked at Robbie and Jimmy. Boys, 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 he said. How many times? Am I going to have to fix it? Eight, said Robbie. <sniffs> Robbie wasn't being smart or cheeky when he said that. He was giving Mr. Mac the correct answer. The window had been broken seven times, and now he was going to have to fix it once more. Seven and one made eight. So Robbie was right. But poor Mr. Mac had had a very hard day. He had spent all day testing cream crackers, and they were very boring biscuits. In fact, Mr. Mac didn't think they were really biscuits at all. They were always perfectly boringly square, and they tasted like nothing except what they were, boring old cream crackers, and poor Mr. Mac had been measuring and eating them all day. 
he was stuffed to the tonsils with cream crackers. He knew. He'd dream about cream crackers that night. He always had the same cream cracker dream day after, after a day of measuring and eating cream crackers. It wasn't a dream about killer ninja cream crackers or beautiful brown eye cream crackers or anything interesting like that. No chance. In this dream, Mr. Mac was always surrounded by talking cream crackers, hundreds of them, all saying the most boring things ever. Babies are smaller than adults. Isn't that interesting? Toilet paper is usually white, but not always. Isn't that interesting? A car has four wheels, but a bike only has two. Isn't that interesting? All night, the talking cream crackers would be yapping at him. That was another reason why Mr. Mac loved fig rolls. They never talked when he went to sleep. He wasn't looking forward to bedtime, even though he was very tired. He could already hear the cream crackers mumbling away in his brain. Some pajamas have stripes, and some don't have any stripes at all. Isn't that interesting? But that wasn't the worst part of the day. Something strange had happened to Mr. Mac at lunchtime. A vulture had swooped down from a tree and robbed his sandwiches. And before he'd had time to get over the shock, the vulture came back and robbed his flask. Then he'd had to fix the broken kitchen window for the seventh time in seven days, and he'd cut his finger doing it. He was hungry and tired, and his finger was sore, and the cream crackers were already yapping at him. If you put your feet in water, they get wet. Isn't that interesting? The vulture had stuck his tongue out at him as he flew away with the flask. The flask had been full of chicken soup, Mr. Mac's all-time favorite. And now, he thought, his children were being cheeky. Mr. Mac had had enough. Go up to your room, he told Robbie. And Jimmy, but I'm hungry, said Jimmy. I don't care, said Mr. Mac. Go up to your room. And that was why the next morning the Pooh was waiting for Mr. Mac. What Master Mac didn't know, and what nobody else knew, was that the gigglers were listening to him. They were in the cupboard under the stairs. They looked at one another and nodded. The treatment, said the smallest very quietly. The treatment, said the biggest. Who, said the smallest. Who, said the biggest. Chapter something. Back at the station, the biggest giggler ducked down. How much now? Eight inches and the middle-sized giggler fell off the bike again. Another chapter. Mr. Mac went into the kitchen. The boy's mother, Billie Jean Fleetwood Mac, was there with the baby, Kayla. Kayla was eating a sugar-free biscuit Abba, she said. No, Billy Jean, said Billy Jean. You can't have one with sugar in it. They're bad for your teeth. Abba, said Kayla. I know you don't have any teeth, said Billy Jean, but you will soon. Abba, yes, I know your father eats biscuits. It's his job. It's dangerous work, said Billy Jean proudly, but somebody has to do it. She spoke to, she now spoke to Mr. Mac. The boys can't go to bed without their supper, she said. 
I know, said Mr. Mac. I'll call them down in a minute. They didn't do it on purpose, said Billy Jean. I know, said Mr. Mac. Ah, bah, said Kayla. I know, said Mr. Mac. Ah, bah, was the only word that Kayla could say so far. But because all the Macs loved her so much, they always understood exactly what she meant. Mr. Mac stroked Kayla's cheek. It's just, it's been a hard day. You should have seen that vulture. Ah, bah, said Kayla. There's the baby. Even bigger, said Mr. Mac. Then he went into the hall and called up the stairs. Boys, come down for your supper. What is it? shouted Robbie. Whatever you want, said Mr. Mac. But the gigglers didn't hear him this time. It was too late. They had gone. They were off looking for the good bit of poo for Mr. Mac's shoe. The chapter after the last one. They waited for the swipe, 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 Mr. Mac rubbing the shoe on some grass, and the chuff, 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 the train leaving, <laughs> and the bang, bang, ouch, Mr. Mac banging his head off the wall. Eight inches, seven, six, five. They waited for the first big thump. Mr. Mac's foot, belly flopping into the you poo what? Fish fingers, said the seagull. Yuck. The middle-sized giggler shoved her other foot into her mouth. Why was it taking so long for Mr. Mac's foot to hit the poo? Good question. Mr. Mac was wearing brand new trousers, and they were very stiff. They were so stiff, he could hardly bend and straighten his legs. Now we'll find out where the gigglers got the you poo what. All right, thank you for listening to the second installment of the giggler treatment. Um, we will keep on reading it anytime Miss Melissa is out or not feeling well. So I count, think that counts as both. Um, see you next time, and I hope you get involved in some of the other library virtual programs. Hope you're all having a nice week. Bye.